Thank you, worship team. Kids, you are dismissed. I have my handy sign there. Oh, I beat you to it, Joan. I beat you this morning. You are a kid and you are in kindergarten to fifth grade. You can head out the back with Miss Joan there. She got a red shirt on. Well, I love that song we just sang called Behold Our God. That song's written out of Isaiah chapter 40. Many people probably don't know that. It's written right from Isaiah chapter 40, actually. It says this, go, a ho- go up. Go on up to a mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. You know, that whole chapter, Isaiah chapter 40, it's all about God and who he is and his might and his power and how he will lead those and comfort those who are weak and weary. One of the things that happens, though, oftentimes today is you hear things like that, or we we read Isaiah chapter 40, and we only pick out the things that we want to hear. I'd be willing to bet if most of you, if I said Isaiah chapter 40, you probably think of something like, he gives power to the faint, and he, he gives increase to those who have no strength. Even you shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now those, those verses offer great hope to us. Those, those verses inspire us. They, they give us a great sense of who we are. But the hope in those verses comes from the rest of that chapter. Those are the last two verses in a 32 chapter or 32 verse chapter that is all about the glory, majesty, splendor, and might of an almighty God and the things that he does in the earth. Recently, I saw this little graphic. I actually have had it on my computer up for a couple weeks. Just found it so interesting. I knew I wanted to talk about it today, but it said this. It says, if the sea couldn't stop Moses... If a wall couldn't stop Joshua, if death couldn't stop Jesus, then in Christ, nothing can stop you. Now, it's hard to know where to begin with that little quip. Some of you might have seen this. So I'd be willing to bet there's somebody here that shared this on their Facebook page. Because it's these sorts of things where we take what we think Scripture is saying, we, we oversimplify what the Bible is actually speaking about, And we pull out this motivational, self-help kind of stuff. It's propaganda is what it is. It serves to create this emotional response in us. That's why we only know the last two verses of Isaiah chapter 40, and we forget the first 30 verses that are all about the majesty, splendor, and might of an almighty God. I mean, can I just be honest about this for a second? A large percentage of people would read something like, if the sea couldn't stop Moses, if a wall couldn't stop Joshua, if death couldn't stop Jesus, then in Christ nothing can stop you. A large percentage of people would read that and feel, well, that's pretty good. That's a good statement. That's nice. This is so common today. It's hard to accurately describe to you how common this is in our society today. Can I just burst your bubble for a second on that statement? Neither you nor I are Moses, Joshua, or Jesus. Yeah, amen, that's right. Now, I doubt anyone is saying that we are, but to suggest that the things that those men did and that God did through those men is somehow an indicator of how our lives will play out and the successes that we will see in this life, that, that's either spiritual ignorance or spiritual denial. That's a complete misunderstanding of how the divinely appointed prophets of God spoke for God and worked for God in their lives. Maybe I'd say it this way. To suggest that you can know what will happen in your life based on the lives of Joshua, Moses, and Jesus, that's actually almost blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because you're using the God-breathed words of the Bible to say something that they do not say. But it's these kinds of things that are so common today. You know, what's funny is we read things like that. If you're on social media at all, you probably see stuff like that a lot. And we read it and we do one of two things more often than I'd be willing to bet. I bet most of you are not like me. 
Most of you probably read it and think, yeah, okay, and you move on. Or you click, oh, share. And that goes out to everybody that follows you now. What's really too bad because what I do and what we ought to do, I think, is go back to the person that shared this and said, that's terrible theology. I think the unfortunate part is that we think this stuff is true. And so therefore, we believe a false Christian understanding of the Bible and we propagate a false understanding of the Bible. It doesn't mean we can't have hope in God. We can't have hope. It doesn't mean that we're not given strength. It just means that we must interpret Scripture properly to understand how all that works. This is really, really important as we study our passage today. We must understand and interpret Scripture in light of what God has said and what was meant and not what we wanted to say for ourselves. This is really, really important today. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 says this, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray as we begin. God, our loving and gracious father, We thank you for the truth of your word and how your spoken word word reveals your very nature and your immutable character to us. We're blessed to be gathered in this place this morning, to be together with the saints of God, gathered as your children, to corporately make up this holy institution known as the church. It's through these promises that we've studied over the last few weeks that we understand the true nature of the church and what our mission is and what our lives might be like. But we also know that it's through the beauty of the fellowship of one another that we see the design for your church clearly displayed as we spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And so now, God, as we spend time together in your word this morning, I pray that you would cause lasting change in our hearts, change that would not only change how we live, but it would change how we fellowship with one another. Pray that the Holy Spirit would bring about conviction in areas that we need to repent and change. Areas where maybe we've spoken falsely of you or your word. And I pray that your spirit would guide us through the change that's necessary for each of us. So we pray that you would do your work in us, Lord, that we might be obedient Christ-like disciples, and we would do all things to the praise of your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Well, our text this morning contains several different pieces or several different quotable sayings, maybe I would say. There there are several different things in here you could just parse out, use on its own, and quote, and you might try to speak of something that Jesus is saying. I've heard a lot of the different parts that we're going to study today used in different contexts and different conversations over the years. What generally happens is what I just described to you. You look at a passage like this, or you find a verse that's contained in a passage like this, and we quote it to one another, we quote it in conversation to prove a point or something that we're thinking about. But what often happens is we're quoting it apart from its context. If you think about think about all the statements that I just read here in in these, these verses, these eight verses. If you put them into one paragraph, they all speak to the same idea or the same concept. Each one of these things is the exact same thing that we sang all those songs about, which is a reliance on God and taking refuge in an almighty God. Now, that's always a good thing for us to talk about. I'm not going to deny any of this is about that. It's exactly about that. However, what often happens, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is we look at passages like this. And there's a tendency for us to focus on us 
in light of this as opposed to what this is actually saying. We, we, we take the context of this, we, we take the passage here, we take it out of its historical literary context, and we read ourselves into it. It makes us feel better. If you read this paragraph that we're looking at today, generally speaking, you understand that God wants to care for you, that you have inherent value, more value than the sparrows. All of that's true. But as R.C. Sproul says, we often want the benefits of God without God himself. Now, long ago, I wrote an article. It's up on our website under Ask Pastor Jason about how to study the Bible properly. If you want to read that article, you can go on the website. It's the question about application for sermons, if you want to look it up. But the issue that I discuss there is that we often jump over the hard work of interpretation of Scripture, which means we first have to observe the text that we're in, then interpret from there, and then after that, then we can somewhat apply the text to our lives. We get the implications of the text, and then we apply it to our lives. But the common methodology today is very opposite of that. We read a text of Scripture just like this, and the first question we ask is, what does this mean to me? What does this passage mean to me? Now, that's about the absolute worst question you could ask for a number of reasons. Because what happens when we ask that question is we forego interpretation and observation completely. Now, I'll just be so bold to say that the reason why we do that is because we're self-absorbed, self-focused people. Anything we can derive a benefit for ourselves, we go right to that. We're drawn to benefits, that, things that benefit us. But then the second reason is we take that and we do what's called narcissism, which we put ourselves right into every text of Scripture. And that's how you end up with something like, well, if the Red Sea couldn't stop Moses. Well, you know, that's true. I'll grant you that. The Red Sea did not stop Moses. But there's a whole lot more to that story, isn't there? Remember, Moses never made it to the promised land. You don't see that part in the motivational speech, do you? You don't see the part that Moses died in the wilderness, never being able to inherit what was promised. Well, then there's that whole other part about all the men that drowned because of the Red Sea. Do you remember that? I suppose it's better to be Moses than it is to be in Pharaoh's army, right? Stitch that on a pillow. <laughs> you see, we can do this with any story. That same quote, it says, well, death didn't stop Jesus. Great. Nobody's arguing that. But to get to that point where death didn't stop Jesus, you had to go through the most horrific possible experience Jesus could have ever encountered, which was separation from God the Father as the outpouring of God's wrath fell upon him on the cross. And all of that was because God had prophesied through the prophets from centuries past that his sovereign plan was to take place and the manner in which it did and the time and the place and everything else so that Jesus would conquer not only death, but would also conquer sin. Not so your loftiest goals could be achieved, but so that you would not spend eternity in hell, but could have eternal life. See, we could do this with any story. We can pull out the story and make ourselves feel good about it. That's not the point. The point is, is what does the Bible actually say? And what is the meaning? And then how does that apply to us? What did the original author mean? Now, in our text today, I want to make this very clear. The original author is not Matthew. Matthew is the transcriber of the original authorship. The original author is actually Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't write these words. He spoke them. When it comes to authorship, you don't have to write. You can speak. Speaking is just a medium in which you author a statement. Look with me now at verse 26. This is Jesus speaking as the author of this text. He says this. So have no fear of them. So have no fear of them. Now he begins this statement or this whole passage that we're in, not just this one statement, this whole passage that we're in. He, he begins it with this statement, so have no fear of them. It, it's actually a sentiment that he repeats three or two other times. It's three times total in our passage today. Here he says, have no fear of them. Verse 28, he says, do not fear. Verse 31, he says, fear not. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that the entire passage that we're covering today 
is this very idea that we are to not fear men. We're not to fear the actions of men. And that's a great thing to understand. That's a great thing to say. I have no doubt that none of you would agree with all of that. All of you would agree with that with me. We should not fear men. But if the only thing you hear me say today is that we should go on living without fearing the actions of men, you've completely missed the point of this passage. Yes, we should not fear men, but that's not the point. So have no fear of them. Okay, them. Let's talk about them for a second. Them are the people from the passage we studied last week. Them, if you look back, is verse 16. The wolves. Them are the men that will deliver you over to courts and flog you in the synagogues. That's verse 17. Them are the dragged before governors and kings. The Gentiles. Them is verse 21. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against their, his parents and have them put to death. That's them. Jesus says you're to have no fear of those people. You're to have no fear of those people who will put you to death, who will take you before rulers and kings and synagogues and flog you there. You're to have no fear of them. Don't fear those people, he says. Now, on the surface, this seems great, right? Wonderful. Because the Red Sea didn't stop Moses, and a wall didn't stop Joshua, and death didn't stop Jesus. I don't have to fear these people. But do you notice this? Look at what Jesus says now. Because the next thing he says is, For nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. This is sort of a, well, they're going to get what's coming to them statement. They're going to do evil things. You don't have to fear them because they're going to get what's coming to them. Do you notice that that doesn't mean the things that they're going to do in the passage we studied last week is going to stop? Do you catch that? Jesus isn't putting an end to all these things. As a matter of fact, that would be ridiculous because he just promised that they're going to do those things. He just said, this is what's going to happen to you. And now he's saying, don't fear that they're going to do it, but not because they're going to stop, but because they're going to get what's coming to them. Now look at verse 27. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. You know, last week we talked about the treatment that Jesus would receive for preaching the message that he preached. And we know what Jesus received. He was called Satan. He was called a worker of Satan. Uh, he was called a lot of other things. He was rejected. He was despised. He was beat, beaten, flogged, and then ultimately crucified. Those are the sort of things that he's promised in his disciples. In verses 24 and 25, we studied, said that whatever I received as your teacher, you're going to receive. That's what Jesus was saying. Disciples not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. You're going to get what I got. You follow me, you're going to get the same, you're going to get the same treatment I got. That's what Jesus got for his work in ministry. That's what the disciples are going to get. But he says you don't have to fear all that. Because in the end, it's going to be found out. He's not saying you won't receive these things, but he's saying that God will judge those things in the end. But then he says, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. What Jesus tells him in the dark, say out loud, say in the light. What I tell you, just you and I, go say from the loudest places and the loudest shouts and the highest places you can find, go say it. Now, for the last three weeks, we've been studying about how the gospel, the message that Jesus sends them out is the most important thing to these disciples' ministry. We've talked about how he gives them the ability to do miracles and all that kind of stuff. But we've talked about how the gospel, the message that they're being sent out is the most important thing. And you remember, we talked about it last week when we said if they were just going out to do miracles, which will be very helpful for all the people that they're going to do the miracles for, why would the people kill them? Why would they have anger towards these people and want to flog them and all those things? It's only because of the message that they would preach that they would be despised. Now, I want you to really catch what Jesus is saying here. This can be very easily overlooked if you don't get this. Jesus says, here's your mission. Go and preach this message. Oh, by the way, when you do that, they're going to try to kill you. And then he says, but don't fear them. Instead, go up to the highest place on the housetops and shout even louder what the message is. Do you catch that? He's not telling them not to do it. He's actually making it worse. 
You know, this is so opposite of our thinking today. I want to make sure this is clear. Jesus spent a long time explaining what the message is. He, he spent time and he's done miracles proclaiming who he is and what the message is. And now he's told them you're going to die because of it. But instead, I want you to go up and proclaim this from the highest places. Now, the best I could come up with this is imagine getting a second story open window on Michigan Avenue at Christmas time. That's what it would have been like to go on the housetops. The housetops would have overlooked the main cities of the street. All the people would have traveled by. All the people that would reject the message and want to kill the disciples, they probably would have walked by and heard the message if the disciples took this literally. Jesus says, go up there and teach. Go up there where everybody can see you and everybody can hear you and preach the message. But he says, don't fear. God's going to judge those people in the end. I hope you see Jesus isn't offering a reprieve here. He's not telling them to avoid the consequences. He's not negating the consequences at all. He's telling them to go to the place where it is almost certain that those who want to kill them will hear them. Sends them right up there. Without this passage was about having warm, fuzzy feelings because you weren't supposed to fear, you're wrong. Just the opposite. Look at verse 28 with me now. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, just a quick note on this verse before we really dig into what it actually means. Don't get caught up in some theological fumbling or mistakes on this. It's very easy to assume that because Jesus says that he can destroy, that God can destroy both soul and body in hell, it leads to a, a false theology called annihilationism. Annihilationism is the theology or the theory that God casts people to hell and then their souls are annihilated, basically being eliminated, so that hell and the punishment that is received there isn't eternal, but it's only for a period of time. Okay? Jesus says very clearly, Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away to eternal punishment. It's clear that hell is forever. When Jesus says in our text that it's to destroy both soul and body, probably a better way of saying that is he's referring to an eternal destruction. Now that seems weird because we think about destroying being a once and for all thing. I don't think Jesus is saying that. What he's saying is he's gonna, God will send these people away to a place that will feel like being destroyed forever. Think about that for a second. Think about what it feels like to be destroyed, if you know what that means in some sense. That's the eternal state of those who end up in hell. However, the actual point of this statement, it, it takes on two distinct but very closely related points. They're important to grasp if we're going to get this whole thing. First, do you, may, do you see it's clear? Jesus has just said, do not fear. And then he says, verse 28, but don't fear those who kill the body. Again, he's not offering any reprieve from death. He's not offering any reprieve from suffering. As a matter of fact, look at how he phrases this. Those who kill the body is actually a subset of people. Don't fear those, put parentheses around it now, those who fear can kill the body. Don't fear those who can kill the body. Those who kill the body is a specific subset of people. Therefore, there are people who will kill the body. Do you catch that? Instead, Jesus is making it clear in this passage, there's those who can kill you, and they will. We just talked about that. Brother will kill brother. Children will rise above their, before their parents and have them put to death. Courts, rulers, they'll have you flogged in their synagogues. You don't have to fear those men, Jesus says. Not because they're not going to be able to kill you, but this is why he adds the last part of the statement. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus makes it very clear that the second death, the second destruction, if you will, is what we should worry about and be concerned with. You don't have to fear dying. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear torture and suffering in this life. You know, the issue that all men has is not whether they will die or not. Just so you know, the death rate in this country and in this world is 100%. Death is not the thing that we should fear. So many of us are concerned about death and how we will die and when we'll die. That's not the thing we should fear, Jesus says. The thing we should fear is the one who has power over your eternity. You know, what's interesting, if you think about this, Jesus has already taught the Sermon on the Mount, likely, at this point. Do you remember who Jesus says is the one who can cast people away? 
Him. Remember that? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? And I'll say to them, away from me, you evildoers. Never knew you. Interesting, as Jesus says these words, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I wonder if the disciples thought, well, that's you. Very simply put, let me just summarize this. Jesus is saying, stop worrying about the things you will experience in this life. Instead, concern yourself with the eternal things. Which, oh, by the way, are the eternal things that I'm sending you out to preach to the world in the first place. This is where we get this wrong, I think. This is where we get evangelism and the mission of the church wrong. We go into the world to preach a message of eternal implications, and we haven't been convinced of it ourselves. We are still fearing death. We're still fearing torture. We're still fearing suffering. And so when we go into the world, we try to tell people, well, it's all about eternity. Well, no, it's not. Not to us. Even though it should be. The other part of the statement that I think is interesting and we should point out here is not only who Jesus says that we should fear, but the reason why. You know, I don't know how many times I've heard in my life that hell's not a good motivator for salvation. Really? Jesus thought so. Jesus says, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus wanted to make sure it was very clear what they thought and what he thought. You know, one of the very common arguments that you will hear today, usually from emergent church types, but I don't like that word because that's sort of going away, emergent church. What you hear is that Jesus, well, when he spoke of hell, he wasn't really referring to a physical place, and that's not really eternal. It's just language that Jesus was using to try to get people, you know, upset or whatever. This is the whole Rob Bell theology. Many like him. Jesus used language that had been understood to be tied to the day, never intended to mean a place that was spent for all eternity. Now, I've already read Matthew 25, 46, which says they'll go away to eternal torment. But you have to do some serious hermeneutical gymnastics to think that. One of their arguments here is the word that's used here in verse 28 for the word hell is the word Gehenna. Now, Gehenna actually is a specific place that Jesus was talking about, or probably similar to a silvery place. Parsed out, the word means gay, which it means valley, and then it meant the Hemon Valley, so Gehenna. It was a steep, rocky ravine just on the southwestern part of Jerusalem, which was probably the garbage dump. It's probably where everybody took all the garbage and all the feces and all the junk from Jerusalem and dumped it in this deep ravine. That was the Hemon Valley. Jesus says in Mark 9 that Gehenna is the place where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. Well, that probably was true in the, fire, in the garbage dump sense. Jesus is referring to a place that's not very nice. That's what he was trying to get across. But here's what I want you to do. I just want you to think about this for a second, okay? Verse 28. In verse 28, the word hell, Gehenna, is referring to a garbage dump. I want you to think about what this says. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in the garbage dump. Do you see how this theology doesn't work when it's compared to Scripture? Why would somebody killing your body be any different than somebody putting your body in a garbage dump? Who cares? We ought to see that Jesus is referring to a very specific place, a place that he talks about a lot, a place that's very real, a place that is more undesirable than losing your life to those who can kill your body. It's a place that he will say is eternal in suffering and eternal in destruction. Now, all of that put together makes a very clear and distinct statement here. The statement is, is eternity is way more important than this life. Where your eternal soul will go is way more important than what you suffer or what you don't suffer in this life. That's what Jesus is saying. And if this world, when it does, rejects you for that message because it's God who will judge, God will condemn them, God will judge their deeds just like he will judge yours, and it's God who will cast those who don't acknowledge him into hell. 
This is why the next three verses are so important. Verses 29, 30, and 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your, of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more valued than many sparrows. These three verses just make up this short quip about what the value of a human soul is. This contrasting analogy about us versus sparrows, very similar to how Jesus compares us to the birds of the air or the lilies of the field in Matthew 6. Jesus says there that the birds will be fed and the lilies will be adorned. We don't have to worry about the things in this life. He's saying the same thing here. He's saying two sparrows are worth a penny, essentially. It's a different word. Yet not even a half a cent sparrow lives or dies apart from God. Do you see that? Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. It is God who causes them to live. It is God who causes them to die. It is God that causes you to live. It's God who causes you to die. It's God who causes you to spend eternity in heaven. And it's God who causes you to spend eternity in hell. What Jesus is trying to communicate here is very clear. Don't you understand the value of a human soul? Don't you understand the value of a human life? Don't you understand what you're worth to God and how that relates to what people might do to you? Human beings are the crown jewel of the creation of God. We're the only part of creation that says we are made in God's image. God gave humans dominion over all other parts of creation. We're infinitely more values than than the half-cent sparrow. Here's the thing, though. I doubt any of you would disagree with me on that. Why? Because we love to talk about this. We love to talk about how much value we have, right? This is right where we go when we talk about these passages. But when you separate that idea that we have inherent value from the context around it, you miss what's actually going on here. This is how you end up with things like that quote I read at the beginning. I don't think the issue here is understanding that God loves us and sees us as valuable. The, understand, the, the issue here is understanding why our value relates to what people will do to us. If people will kill us and people will scorn us and people will mock us and flog us and all those things, it doesn't matter because our value is in God's eyes and in God's hands, not in our own and not in our own lives. Look at verse 32 now. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. You know, the crux of these two verses is really less about the denial of Christ in an acute sense as much as it is an overall denial. What I mean by that is, remember Peter, Peter denied Christ three times on the night Jesus was betrayed. Yet it was Peter who was part of the inner three of the disciples It was Peter's confession that Jesus said, I'll build my rock upon. It was really, it was Peter who was the de facto leader of the early church. It was Peter who preached the message at Pentecost, probably on the southern stairs of the temple. He preached the message when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers and the New Testament church was begun right there. It was Peter who preached. Yet Peter denied Christ. Denied him verbally three times, just as Jesus predicted. Now I'm sure... Peter had to answer for that denial when he stood before Jesus after his death. But to make these two sentences or these two verses about the fact that if you deny Christ at all, at least in the acute sense, that then you are therefore not acknowledged before God, then you would have to believe then that Peter is no longer in heaven or never was. Do you catch that? This is much more about an overall acknowledgement and an overall denial. It's about the hallmark of your life. This entire passage could be rightly understood just by these two statements right here. For several weeks now, we've been talking about the commissioning these disciples. I'm going to keep going back to this because this is what it's about. These disciples, Jesus commissioned them and they're now apostles. He's sending them out into the world. He's granted them gifts like miracles and healings and raising the dead and casting out demons. These men, Jesus sends to the lost sheep of the house of Israel to share the message that the kingdom of God is at hand. They're to to go out and call men to repentance and faith, all for the sake of the salvation of their souls. The miracles that they do are only to serve as a sign that they have been sent by God himself 
In this case, it's Jesus. We saw two weeks ago that when these men go to a town to preach the good news, that it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah than the towns that reject their message. The message of the kingdom of God is at hand, that the Messiah has come into the world. That is to be the very message that's preached, that is to be the very center of what these men do. And the acceptance or denial of that message is the factor by which people will be judged. That's what we've been talking about for three weeks now. Well, it's no different in verses 32 and 33. The most clear and profound understanding of what this Jesus is saying here is this. If you acknowledge Christ before men, if you acknowledge him with your life and with your death and with the words that you speak, then you will be acknowledged before God. However, if you deny him, if you deny him before men, including the message that he preached, he will deny you before his father also. Do you see where Jesus is going with all this? Do you you see how all this is coming together now? There's no greater truth than this message. There's no more important thing that we're to understand. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe. To To the Jew first and then to the Greek, Paul writes. This is the message we preach. This is the message we acknowledge. This is the message we believe. And this is the message that we will be judged by when we get to heaven. But last week we saw that there are earthly consequences for believing and preaching this. This message is is a hostile world will reject. And those who live for Christ and preach the gospel of Christ, the message of sin and hell and repentance of faith and eternity in heaven, those who preach that message will be killed, they will be flogged, they will be dragged before rulers and authorities, they will be treated like lowlifes and slaves in this world. One of the questions I posed to you last week was, why don't we see this stuff going on to us? Why don't we see the things that we studied last week happening to us? And one of the reasons that I gave was is that we we just don't preach the message the way it's supposed to be preached. One of of the things that I said was is that we preach this squishy gospel that costs people nothing to follow, costs nothing for them to believe, costs nothing in their life, and so we're just propagating a message that nobody really cares about. They say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but it doesn't cost anybody anything. You could argue the closest thing to that in Matthew 23, when Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees, he says, you travel across land and sea to make a convert. You know what he calls them? He says, you make them twice the sons of hell as you are. The false religion of the Pharisees meant that every time they converted somebody, they did not make them a true son of God. They made them an enemy to God, and they gave that person a false hope and eternity, which they did not have. I shared with you why I thought we don't experience the things Jesus says, because we don't preach the true gospel. But the thing that I didn't talk about last week, I wanted to wait till this week, is why. Why don't we share the true gospel with the world? Why do the things that happen in verses 16 to 24, 25, not happen to us? Well, the reason is because we don't preach the gospel. We don't preach the true gospel to the world. The question is, why don't we do that? Jesus says right here, have no fear. God takes care of the sparrows, and you have more value than them. Don't you think you'll be looked at more than God? Don't you think we shouldn't have fear? Don't you think we should be bold in proclaiming the gospel? Why don't we? Church, the reason why we are so apt to not share the gospel, and we've watered down the gospel and made it so that it doesn't cost anybody anything, is because we're afraid. Jesus says it three times here, do not fear, have no fear. You know why he says that? Because he knew this is how we would react. He knew that when we preach the gospel and the consequences came to us, we'd be afraid of those things. We're afraid. We're afraid of having small churches. We're afraid of people beating us and mocking us and kicking us out of our jobs. We're afraid of people, not God. The reason why we're so afraid of them and why we don't preach the gospel today is because we focus too much on this brief life and the things that we have and the things that we don't want to experience and not on the things that await us in eternity. If it's God and his judgment which determines our eternity, that which we should be afraid of, that's what Jesus is saying right there. Why do we worry about what men say about us and what men will do to us? Why? 
If it's God who created us, we, we sang all those songs this morning, how great is our God, how great thou art, behold our God. That God that you sang about, it's God who's ordained every single step of every single person, so much so that he's numbered the hairs on your head, verse 30. He's the God who sent Jesus into the world to atone for your sin. Remember, God demonstrates his own love for us on this, that while we were still sinners, while we were haters of God, Christ died for you and me. It's God who will judge the living and the dead. It's God who will judge everyone on the last day. It's God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And if we understand that, and we understand the message of the cross, then we understand the message that we are sent to preach. The gospel is ultimately about God and not about us. Can I just say this? Do you understand the message that you live out in your life and the message you preach to the world has eternal implications? Your eternity and the eternity of those you preach to hangs in the balance of the message that you preach. Which means then that when you don't preach sin and you don't reach repentance and you don't preach about hell because we don't want to say those things because we're afraid of what men will do to us, you are damning the person to a hell by not preaching the gospel to them. That doesn't mean they won't hear it. It just means they're not going to hear it from you. And when you give somebody a false hope and a false gospel and you take them to a false church, you're making them twice the sons of hell that you are. That's what Jesus said. Church, if we really feared God and not men, that's what we would preach. Instead, what Jesus is saying here is pretty clear. These men, don't have any fear of them. These people who will kill you and do all these nasty things to you, don't fear them. They can't kill your soul. They can only kill your body. Their deeds will be made known. They'll be judged for those things. But if you acknowledge me before them, I will acknowledge you before God, Jesus says. Church, there's no greater message we believe, preach, speak, or live out. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, understood this very plainly. We quote these words a lot, to live as Christ and to die as gain. What I want to do to close this morning is I just want to read to you the context of that passage. I think it speaks directly to what we're talking about today. Listen to this. Paul says, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. He says, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. That means he's ready to die. For that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary, Paul says, on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Do you hear what Paul says? To live as Christ and die as gain means that you are given this life to serve God and to faithfully labor for him preaching the gospel. And you know what the gift that you get for that is? The gift that you get for that is to believe in him and suffer for his sake. That's what you get. You don't get a nice house. You don't get nice cars. You don't get new clothes and new shoes. You don't even necessarily get a nice church, although this is a great blessing for us to have. Do you know what you get? You get to suffer for the sake of Christ because Jesus suffered first. Church, we don't have to fear what men say or do. Yes, this passage is about not fearing men. But this isn't some motivational speech so you're going to achieve all your dreams. This isn't some motivational speech so you can walk around and say, well, I don't have any fear. This is an eternal message wrought in eternity past, which God has sent to us into the world to preach and to believe and to suffer for. 
This is the message of the cross, plain and simple. That all those who fear God and understand his gospel and trust in Christ don't have to fear. Because the only thing you should fear is the one who can cast the soul and body into hell. I wonder today, church, how this message will change us. I wonder how this message will change how we think, how we feel, and how we act in the world. I wonder if this passage will change how you witness and how you evangelize the world. I wonder if you've been dealing with fear and sharing your faith with other people. I wonder if you come to church on Sunday and it's real nice and we sing nice music and there's nice people and we talk to everybody and we don't share our faith from Monday to Saturday and the reason is because we're afraid. We're afraid of what people will say. We're afraid of what people will think. Church, I pray that you would fear God more than men. I pray that as you fear God, you would go and preach his message to the world. That's what we're here for, Paul says. Bow your head and pray with me. God, our Father, we thank you that we can live this life without fear. God, that we can know you in this life, uh, that we can know the power of salvation. We can see your love demonstrated for us on the cross. God, that we can know Jesus. God, that we can go through our days, go through our lives, not fearing what men say and do, not fearing the schemes of wicked people. But God, that we could go through this life fearing you. God, knowing it is you, you who controls our eternal destiny. And so God, we give you thanks today that through Christ we can know you and have hope and not fear. I pray today, God, that that message would sit heavy on our hearts. I pray that it would transform us. I would pray that it would transform how we live and how we speak and how we act. God, not that we might, we might be better people, that we might be motivated to live better, but God, that we would be earthen vessels used for your glory in this world, that your gospel would be preached from our mouths every day. God, the world might know your gospel, they might hear it on their ears, and we know that they will reject it, and we know that they will hate us, but that's not the point. God, we know that salvation comes by hearing in this the word of God. And I pray that's what you would cause us to do as you work your Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name.